All right, are you ready for this? Today, we're diving deep, deep into the world of complex surgical procedures. You know, the kind of stuff that makes you glad you're just listening and not actually under the knife, but fascinating nonetheless. The source material for this deep dive, a podcast actually aimed at surgeons, so yeah. It's got the nitty gritty, the technical details most people wouldn't even dream of, but trust me. We're here to distill it all down, pull out the juiciest bits, those insights that'll make you say, whoa, I did not know that. You know, what always gets me about these advancements in surgery, it's not just about like the fancy new tools or robots, it's how those innovations actually change the whole approach to patient care, you know, from the very beginning, diagnosis, all the way through surgery, and even that long-term recovery. That's so true. It's like a whole chain reaction mm. of improvements. And speaking of changing approaches, we've got to start with this one, the Whipple procedure. It's often used for pancreatic cancer, and let me tell you, it's infamous, notorious even, for its complexity. I mean, picture this. They're in there removing parts of the pancreas, duodenum, stomach, gallbladder, sometimes even part of the bile duct. It's not just about taking out the bad stuff. They need incredibly detailed imaging beforehand just to map out all those vital structures they have to carefully, carefully work around. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this procedure just highlights how critical a surgeon's skill, their precision really is. We're talking major blood vessels, these mm. delicate, intricate connections within the digestive system. It's mind blowing. Yeah. And it's not like it's over when they stitch them up, the post-op care. Intense, incredibly complex, a whole team of specialists involved, managing everything from nutrition to pain management. It really goes to show how surgery has evolved from like this one man show to a whole orchestra of expertise. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right. Let's switch gears a bit. Talk about something a lot of us have at least heard of. Good old D-E-R-D. You know, that persistent heartburn, that burning feeling that seems to defy gravity? Yeah, that's G-E-R-D. And while a lot of people manage it just fine with medications, sometimes those fail and then surgery becomes an option. One of the procedures they do is called a Neeson fund application. And get this, it actually reshapes the anatomy. They wrap part of the stomach around the esophagus to basically reinforce that valve and stop the reflux in its tracks. It's really remarkable when you think about it, how they can actually adjust the body's own structure to fix a problem. But it also underscores that surgery isn't always the first line of defense, right? Doctors use a bunch of tests to confirm it's the right choice for each patient. They'll look at how well the esophagus is working, how much acid is coming up, all that, to figure out if surgery is truly necessary. It's like a puzzle, figuring out the best approach for each individual person. Okay, ready for something a little, shall we say, more intense. Let's talk about perforated diverticulitis. Now, diverticulitis itself, it's pretty common, but when one of those little pouches in the intestine actually ruptures, that's when things get serious. We're talking potentially life-threatening, requiring immediate surgery. And for a long time, that meant a colostomy, basically creating an opening in the abdomen to let waste bypass the damaged area. And this, huh. this is a perfect example of how modern surgery is always, always pushing to be less invasive. While a colostomy might still be necessary sometimes, surgeons can now often go in and reconnect those healthy parts of the colon, you know. Sometimes they'll use a, a diverting ileostomy, which is temporary, just to give the colon time to heal before they put everything back together. It's amazing how adaptable they have to be, even in those emergency situations. Yeah. Speaking of high-pressure situations, picture this. Mm -hmm. A patient comes into the ER after a car accident. They're bleeding internally. Things get serious, fast, and it becomes clear the liver is damaged. They're about a race against time. This is where the trauma surgeon's training really shines. They need that ability to assess the situation in an instant cool head prevailing. How stable is the patient? How bad is the bleeding? Sometimes close monitoring is enough, but other times. Other times they have to act fast, perform a laparotomy, basically an emergency surgery to open the abdomen and find that bleeding source. And it's during a laparotomy where they might use techniques like, get this packing the liver to control the bleeding. Have you ever heard of that? It sounds intense. Intense is an understatement. They use sterile gauze or sponges to apply direct pressure to the bleeding area. It's buying time, really, while they work to identify and control the source of the bleed. Talk about thinking on your feet. Absolutely incredible. Okay, let's shift gears again, talk about something that's surprisingly common, can affect anyone really at any age, hernias. We tend to think of hernia repair as pretty routine, but it can get complicated, especially for patients who are obese. Absolutely. That added weight, it puts a lot of stress on the abdominal wall, makes the surgery itself riskier, increases the chances of complications down the line. Definitely. Wild, right? It's like this whole other layer of complexity that you wouldn't necessarily think about. 
for sure. And it's where we see surgeons taking this like more holistic approach, you know, like for obese patients thinking about hernia repair, they might recommend a staged approach. So that could mean weight loss before surgery, sometimes even bariatric surgery to get them healthier overall. Reduce those surgical risks before they even touch the hernia. It really shows how interconnected everything is, you know? Totally. Like one thing leads to another. You got to address the foundation first. Yeah. And speaking of connections, this podcast we're diving into, it also talks about how innovations in one area, they often have this ripple effect, impact other fields. Like, did you know they're using minimally invasive techniques for brain surgery now? Wild, right? I know. It's amazing, right? Like with brain metastases, for example, those are the cancerous growths that spread to the brain from elsewhere in the body. But now they can target them with this technique called stereotactic radio surgery, SRS. SRS for the brain. Okay, break that down for me. How do you operate on something as delicate as the brain without, you know, actually operating? Well, it's not scalpels in the traditional sense. With SRS, they use these highly focused beams of radiation to zap those tumor cells. Incredible precision. So they're minimizing damage to the surrounding healthy tissue. It's like they're using technology to fine tune these treatments. Incredible. And it's not just the brain. Think about abdominal aortic aneurysms, triple A's for short. Those are dangerous bulges in the aorta, you know, that main artery carrying blood from the heart. Okay, those sound those sound pretty terrifying, I imagine, if one of those rushers is bad news, right? Yeah, a ruptured triple A is a five alarm fire, life threatening surgical emergency. But for smaller aneurysms, sometimes careful monitoring is all they need. It's the larger ones, or if they're causing symptoms, that's when surgery often comes into play. And the good news, we've seen a huge shift towards less invasive techniques in recent years. So what's the new approach? What are they doing differently now? One of the coolest developments is endovascular aneurysm repair, EVAR. So instead of this big open surgery, they can go in through an artery in the groin, thread a catheter up to the aneurysm. Then they deploy a stent graft, basically a tiny fabric tube, to reinforce that weakened section of the aorta, prevent a rupture. Wow. So they're basically rebuilding the artery from the inside out. Mm -hmm. It's like something out of a sci-fi movie. It seems like this whole minimally invasive thing, it's like the biggest trend in surgery these days, wouldn't you say? You're definitely picking up on a theme here. It's all about minimizing the impact on the patient while still getting the job done. And speaking of minimizing impact, this podcast, they also touch on rectal prolapse. Now, I know, maybe not the most glamorous topic, but... Yeah, no judgment here. We're all adults, right? And honestly, anything to do with the human body, it's fascinating to me. Right. I'm with you there. And just like with those AAAs, the approach to rectal prolapse, it's all about being less invasive whenever possible. Before we get into that, though, can you back up a bit? What even causes rectal prolapse in the first place? Sure thing. So it happens when the rectum, the last part of the large intestine, basically weakens and protrudes out of the anus. Lots of things can cause it, childbirth, chronic constipation, even previous surgery in that area. So how do they even go about fixing something like that? Well, the treatment really depends, you know, on the severity, the overall health of the patient. Sometimes non-surgical approaches are enough, like dietary changes or pelvic floor exercises. But for those who need surgery, there are two main ways they go about it abdominal or perineal. Okay, what's the difference there? So abdominal, as you might guess, means they're operating through the abdomen. That can be traditional open surgery or laparoscopically, and it allows them to repair the prolapse and secure the rectum, prevent it from happening again. The perineal approach, that's done through an incision near the anus. That one might be better suited for older patients or those who are higher risk and might not tolerate a bigger abdominal surgery as well. So again, it's all about tailoring the approach to the individual patient what's best for them. Exactly. One size fits all doesn't really apply in surgery. Now, moving on, let's talk about a procedure that's often done in critical care settings, tracheostomies. Tracheostomies. Okay. I know those are sometimes necessary when someone can't breathe on their own, hmm. but I've always wondered, what does that procedure even involve? So basically the surgeon creates a small opening in the trachea, that's the windpipe, and they insert a tube to let air bypass any blockages in the upper airway. It can be a real lifesaver, especially for patients who need to be on a ventilator for a long time. So is it better to have a tracheostomy than to be on a ventilator through the mouth or nose? Yeah, especially for long-term ventilation, tracheostomies tend to be more comfortable because that tube isn't in the way in the mouth or nose. Plus, it makes it easier to wean patients off the ventilator when they're ready. Makes sense. This podcast really does cover the gamut, doesn't it? Now, let's talk kidneys for a minute. What happens when someone has a suspicious growth, a tumor, on their kidney. 
That's a really common concern. But the good news is we have a lot of effective ways to diagnose and treat renal masses these days. Usually the first step is imaging, something like a CT scan or an MRI to get a good look at the mass, its size, its characteristics. And then what? Do they always go straight to surgery? Not always. Sometimes for small masses that don't look too worrisome on the imaging, active surveillance is the way to go. Especially for older patients or those with other health conditions, they'll just keep an eye on it with regular scans, make sure it's not doing anything funky. So they're basically playing a watchful waiting game, see if it needs action later on. What happens if it does start growing or looking more suspicious? Then surgery might be on the table, and these days they'll often try to do a partial nephrectomy if they can. That means they remove just the tumor, leaving as much healthy kidney tissue as possible. Which makes sense. I mean, the kidneys are so important for filtering waste, regulating fluids. You don't want to lose more than you have to. Exactly. Preserving kidney function is critical. And the amazing thing is surgical techniques have gotten so good that they can often do that, even in complicated cases. And speaking of complicated cases, this podcast wrapped up by discussing bariatric surgery, which, you know, we're seeing a lot more of these days. It's true. With obesity rates still climbing, bariatric surgery has become a much more common and effective option for people who are struggling to lose weight. It's still major surgery, of course, and it needs a comprehensive evaluation to make sure the patient is ready, physically and emotionally, for the procedure and the lifestyle changes it brings. So it's not just about the surgery itself, it's about the whole picture, the patient's overall health and well-being. Precisely, and candidates for bariatric surgery, they usually work with a whole team, surgeons, dietitians, psychologists, you name it. It's about making sure they have the best possible outcome, not just in terms of weight loss, but their overall health in the long run. It's like a whole support system built around a single procedure. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. And there are different types of bariatric surgery now, right? I know there's gastric bypass, but what other options are out there? Oh, absolutely. There are a few different procedures, each with its own, you know, mechanisms and, of course, potential benefits and risks. This podcast focused on two of the most common, the ruan y gastric bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy. I always thought gastric bypass was the most common one, you know, just what I'd heard. It used to be the go-to, for sure, yeah. but sleeve gastrectomy has gotten really popular in recent years. Both of them, they limit how much you can eat, but they do it in kind of different ways. I'm really curious about those differences, how they actually work. Okay, so with the Rue on Y gastric bypass, the surgeon creates this small pouch at the top of the stomach, and then they connect that pouch directly to the small intestine. So they're basically bypassing a big chunk of the stomach and digestive tract. So smaller stomach, less absorption. It's a double whammy. Ah, so it's like a two-pronged approach. Makes sense. And what about the sleeve? With the sleeve gastrectomy, they actually remove a large portion of the stomach. What's left looks like, well, a banana-shaped sleeve, hence the name, right? This limits how much food the stomach can hold, obviously, but it also messes with the hormones that regulate hunger. Like, it actually reduces how much Greenland your body produces. That's the hormone that makes you feel hungry. Wow. So it's not just about the physical act of eating less. It's actually changing the signals your body's sending to your brain. Exactly. And that brings us to a really important point this podcast made, that multidisciplinary approach, you know, it's not just about the surgery. It's about the whole patient, their overall health and well-being before, during, after the procedure. It takes a village, you know, surgeons, dietitians, psychologists, the whole team. It's like this whole support system, mm -hmm. all centered around this one procedure. It's pretty remarkable when you really think about it. Yeah. You know, thinking back on everything we've covered in this deep dive, it's been quite a journey from those life-saving emergency procedures to like you said, these more, I guess, elective procedures for chronic conditions. It really shows you how much more there is to surgery than just, you know, scalpels and stitches. Uh, it does. We've seen how those techniques have advanced, the incredible skill it takes, the precision, and that emphasis on tailoring the treatment to the individual patient, their specific needs. What's something that really stood out to you? You know, for me, it's got to be that focus on minimally invasive techniques it's just amazing how surgeons are always finding new ways to do what they do with less impact on the body, but still get these incredible results. It speaks to their dedication, constantly trying to improve, refine their craft. It's pretty inspiring. I agree. It makes you wonder what they'll come up with next, you know? Yeah. Nanobots doing surgery from the inside. Yeah. Growing new organs in a lab. Who knows what the future holds right? But one thing's for sure, surgery will keep evolving, keep pushing those boundaries, and we'll be here to try to wrap our heads around it. Well said. And on that note, 
I think it's time for us to close this chapter of our exploration of complex surgical procedures. It's been a fascinating journey for sure, but remember, it's only the beginning. There's always more to learn, more to discover, and the world of surgery. It's not slowing down anytime soon, so keep those brains engaged. Couldn't agree more. Until next time, everyone, keep asking those questions, keep learning, and keep diving deep into this amazing world of science and medicine. You never know what you might find.